Welcome once again to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's go to Off the Press, uh, where we have a review of the major stories making headlines across the country this morning. We'll start with the Daily Independent uh, newspapers this morning, and of course our guests will be joining us right after uh, the stories have been shared. The big one, of course, um, expecting that to be on your screen in just a few seconds. Yes, it says federal government targets 4.2% economic, economic growth to borrow 6.45 trillion naira. Analysts see new petrol price regime soon and budget hollow and bogus with high resounding or high sounding figures, says CUPP. Also on the Daily Independent, condemnation trails reps directive to NCAA on Nigerian or NG Eagle. PDP um, neck OK zoning of national chairmanship position to north. Defers zoning of presidential tickets and also Nigerians have right to determine who governs them says Atiku. Gunmen attack a boy in communities, kill two policemen and eight others. Why I won't support throwing PDP presidential ticket open. That's from Bode George. INEC releases final list of Anambra gubernatorial candidates. And court sentences uh, Maynard's son face all to 14 years imprisonment. And also, Buhari not planning emergency rule in Anambra, says Obiano. Um, of course, Storm Zasorok says Malami goofed, accuses the APC of plotting to rig gubernatorial polls. Army arrests Nollywood actor Chiwetel Loagu, denies brutalizing him. We can also see on the, uh, away from the Daily Independent now to the leadership newspapers, it says federal government secretly raises electricity tariff. Adjustment inevitable as government can no longer sustain sust, uh, subsidy payment. It's unfortunate and deceitful, says uh, customers. You can borrow to fund 2022 budget, National Assembly tells President Mohamed Buhari. Experts warn against rising debt. And PDP ratifies Uguayan's report on zoning. Atiku reacts. 206 kidnapped victims regain freedom in Zamfara and Kaduna. And the court jails may now son face all to 14 years imprisonment. Uh, access to malaria vaccine will save 264,000 children annually, say experts. And now to the Punch newspapers, 16.39 trillion Naira budget funding, sell refineries, moribund assets, reduce deficit, uh, economists, uh, National Assembly tell Buhari, address insecurity, don't impose multiple taxes on manufacturers, says uh, uh, XLCCIDG. And also block tax loopholes, impose levies on luxury goods, economists to uh, council federal government. We can also see on the punch this morning, flooding will compound cholera crisis and lead to more deaths, says the water aid. Uniben suspends locked lecturer, orders police probe of alleged students' rape. And um, we can see here, abductor shoots colleague dead as Ondo Amotekun closes in. Smuggled Tokumba gas cylinders flood in Nigerian markets, says SON. Still on the punch, Nigeria grants 992.9 billion Naira import waivers in two years. Fully vaccinated Nigerians need no pre-departure tests and quarantine, says the UK. And experts celebrate malaria vaccine breakthrough as federal government uh, plans procurement. Chairmanship, PDP governors insist on North. NEC adopts zoning report. We can also see here Maynard son jailed 14 years. Father applies to reopen defense. 24 billionaire pension fraud fleeing convicted director's case stalled over AGF's fiat. I think that's all we're taking on the punch. Let's now uh, quickly go to the Daily Trust newspapers. It says here, Bajabia Mila, governors and others spend millions to visit Tinubu. 265 million naira expended on trips. No, we funded it ourselves, say governors and uh, lawmakers. Politicians wasted public money on, on journeys, and that's from CSOs, as Lagos government unveils pro Tinubu group. In Anambra, federal government backs Malami on possible state of emergency. Buhari opposed to it, says Obiano. And also UK to recognize Nigeria's COVID-19 vaccine certificate from the 11th of October. Nigeria's uh, Nigeria's proposed 16.39 trillion naira budget raises more questions and less hope. These are the stories. And I also, you know, um, say good morning to Jide Johnson, as the chief lecturer at Nigerian Institute of Journalism. Thanks for joining us this morning, Jide Johnson.
Good morning, good morning. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be with you and good morning to our, to our viewers. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, first of all, um, I, I'm, I'm going to start with the Abdul Rashid Mena and his son story. And first, uh, um, correct myself, I had said 24 years earlier in my intro, it's actually 14 years uh, jail time that uh, Faisal has gotten. So let's start with that, Jude Johnson. Is this, you know, good news in the fight against corruption? Well, it's, um, it's, it's a step in the right direction. It does a step in, in, the, in the right direction. And a journey of a thousand miles starts with taking the right step. I hope we'll take the second steps to ensure that he is arrested and um, he parated back to Nigeria, wherever wherever he is, um, just like um, Namdi Kano was 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 was, um, was arrested and he was brought back to Nigeria. I think we will deploy the resources of the federal government and might not in that manner, um, not but in that in that direction using all legal means to ensure that those that have been convicted are brought to justice. It's very, very, very important. And I'm sure um, there are people that took shorty for him. And those also should be, should, should be looked out for and then let them produce him so that they can face the consequences of, 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 his, of his action. Beyond himself and his dad, in that scheme, who are, those that, who are others that were involved, it's not possible for those two people to steal that amount of money without other officials, either in the public sector or in the banking sector, being complicit in stealing that particular that particular money and that particular amount of money. So it's a step in the right direction. I hope we take the second step, we take the third step, the first step, we don't just get stuck by taking this step forward and we take Ten step backward. That has been the issue with our fight against corruption. We take one giant step, and then we take um, 10, 20 monumental steps uh, backward. So for me, it's a welcome development. Okay. All right. Um, well, you know, I, I, I agree with you. You know, with your uh, thoughts on you know not just both of them being guilty here. There's many other people who definitely were accomplices who also help them facilitate this fraud you know and i think it's the same thing that you know we need to have these conversations with regards even governors and national assembly members and whoever else um is, is accused of these crimes even you know most times we see just one person uh, being accused and being sentenced uh, for uh, money laundering of billions of naira but we forget that there's many many other people who were also party to that theft um, and so yes you know it's a conversation that needs to be had and we need to do better, uh, basically, in the fight against corruption. Now, let's go to the southeast, where, of course, you know, there's videos of um, veteran actor Chua Talago being assaulted by uh, army officers yesterday. I want to get your thoughts on, on that. The um, Actors Guild of Nigeria has Where's said that he was wrong for putting on those collars. Um, I've also seen Inibehe Efiong uh, write his, you know, put out his own uh, statement on social media saying there's nothing actually wrong with wearing whatever collars you choose to wear. It might be a little tricky, uh, seeing that um, you know the South is currently is dealing with its own issues. But I, I want to get your thoughts on, on this. It, it is fundamental human right of self-expression. You can't be, you can't, you can't, you can't. It's it's a fundamental. How would you say that be a frank color? Could you have said it's Kenya color? Could you have said it's Ethiopian color? And there was the right of the military in arresting. It's the job of the police. And you see, um, some of us have argued that is Nigeria a democratic society or Nigeria is, is under civilian rule. When you have democratic rule, military authorities are subjected to civilian control. If you are very, very loud and clear, in, you know how many, how many people insulted Jonathan while he was president? Or Donald Trump while he was president. Or if you if you are very, very conversant online and see what is going on in America, um, where people willingly and freely welcome um, the president wherever he visits with with um, with flags of Donald Trump one or F U C K Joe Biden or I love Brandon. Have you ever seen anybody being arrested for that? Whereby someone said something on towards towards the president of the United States. That's that's um, 
those are democratic values. Why would you, because it's putting on, and then you see this military, they are quick to do that in the southeast. It's not Operation Thunder, Operation Okudai Tears, or what have you. And then when you go to the other side of the country, Operation Smile, Operation This, Operation That, you've seen Mieti Alas, um, spokesperson, trending fire and brainstorm on the nation. We've seen governors being accompanied by the police and the DSS to talk to bandits. But innocent citizens that are working on the street, that felt um, that they want to give expression to their views and their thoughts. In democracy, majority we have their minority, we have their say. So what stops me from wearing something that relates to the Dua Republic or something? It's just a self-expression. So wearing it there does not mean that he's carrying out, did he conduct in what, did he conduct himself in a violent manner? So I, I totally condemn them. And I think if he has lawyers, he should sue the Nigerian, the Nigerian army, he should sue the Nigerian government, and an old government accountable to that. And, and I, every Nigerian is entitled to self-expression, self-expression, self-determination. I, I mean, decide that I don't want um, my part of the country to be part of Niger. In as much as I didn't engage in violence, I can see it and express it that you know what, from my experience, I think it would be better for Lagos State, for example, to be detached from the entire Nigerian nation because I'm from Lagos State. So that's my self-expression. It doesn't mean that I don't have a right to 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 to, to say that. What I don't have the right to do is to engage in violent conduct to carry out such 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 acts, such thoughts, such such feelings. So. For me, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. And every time the military does this, they just take a minus of whatever image, positive image they have with the citizenry from themselves. Yeah, you know, I want you to speak a little bit more about that because I was saying earlier that the, the Nigerian army has continued to keep in itself um, with being involved with civil you know, cases and, and things that they really should have no business with. Um, isn't this you know, even causing more damage? To the image of the Nigerian yeah, it's army, it has caused it has caused serious damage to the to the image of the Nigerian army. It has caused serious damage to to to, to how Nigerians see the Nigerian army. Is the Nigerian army representing them, or is he is he is he an occupation force? Because I, I just can't complain. And I try. Uh, hopefully, we in 2023 we we'll have someone that does not have military background, military antecedent becoming the president of this nation. I'm not too sure um, that particular group, um, they, are, they are limited now. Because, you know, the present president has a military background and he was the former head of state, just like we had when we started this democratic experience in 1999 with Obasanjo, who also had a military background and was also a former, a former head of state. So um, um, no matter how it rains, you can watch the sport in the, in the, the skin, the black spot in the skin of a leopard, leopard skin. And don't forget, these people joined the military while in their in their formative in their formative years. So they've already been formed in terms of their thought, in terms of their thinking pattern, and in terms of their values. So that's why we have said Nigeria is not truly a democratic society. Nigeria is still a civilian state. Having a civilian rule does not reflect or does not connote that you have. Um, 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 democratic side. There's, there are a lot of factors, there are a lot of indices that must be put in place. Respect for human liberty, constitutionalism, obedience of court order, um, operating within the ambit of the rule of law, um, subjugation of military, military, military authority to civil, military authority to civilian authority. All of these factors um, are what determines whether a society is a democratic or is autocratic or is despotic. So, if you use all those indicators as 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 a measurement yardstick, then you understand that truly we are still far, far, far away from having a democratic a democratic society. All right. Well, since you brought up 2023, we're going to now move into 2023 conversations um, where there's something called the Swaga Group. Um, and of course, um, in Lagos here, the of course the Lagos State Government did um, you know a somehow some way Tinubu uh, campaign group uh, yesterday. Um, it, it was of course um, all over headlines, and of course there were video clips all over the place. Uh, the Lagos State Governor was there. You know, artists you know came out to perform, and of course there is also the song. You know, on your mandate we stand. You know, all of that. 
So quickly also share well, your thoughts uh, on that one. It's on the... Uh, on right, the um, one of my, um, my... The former chairman of my local government um, was involved in it. He, in terms of... In, instead of doing governance for us in the local government, he was involved in what they call their swagger, swagger movement. And I don't know how to be using taxpayers' money. This is where yes it needs to start. What we need to do is to prevent... Is to prevent um, people stealing the money in the first instance, putting measures in place wasting public resources, uh, using public resources for purposes they were not budgeted for. This is where it starts. And I think that PSC should not wait for them to steal the, the money for people to put their hand in the cookie jar, go into the into the coffers of the state to run their own personal agenda. This is where they should start. Not until they do that before they start doing their financial. There should be financial intelligence before financial prosecution. We should gather facts to prevent and forestall what is happening. Why will still government resources be used to push to the past presidential ambition of an individual? And for me, um, let, let's wait and see where their swagger will take them to, whether their swagger will take them to Asurok. And if they are using swagger to get to Asurok, definitely Nigerians should be ready for swag and not for proper governance. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's a waste of time, waste of public resources, for government to be thinking about the presidential ambition of someone that has not even openly declared his presidential, he has not openly declared his presidential, and we are still in 20, we are still in 2021, and they are talking about. So you just see that these people are concerned about 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 politics and not about governance, and that's why governance has suffered has suffered them in Nigeria. Let them call politics and let them waste whatever resources they want to waste. It, ultimately, it is the Nigerian people that will decide who will be their president. If Nigerian people want swagger, let's go for swagger. If they don't want swagger, they will decide uh, whatever they want concerning them um, 2022. But I think um, we shouldn't be doing this. If you relate this story to the jamboree of lawmakers going to visit um, um, the the principal of swagger, the people that swagger are clamoring for to be the president, the speaker, governors, have the, which resources, like, the millions have been wasted. Which resources are being used to? Because these are the areas in which ESC should collect their intelligence. And when they leave office, they ask them to pay back to, to the society. You know, I ask this when um, when Richard Nixon was 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 um, was impeached as the president of United States of America, and he was taking Air Force One to take him. The moment he was impeached, in fact, American people were saying that they should pay back whatever resources he used in that aircraft in taking him out because he got a presidential pardon from Gerard Ford. That was why he was not held accountable for that. Who, whose resources are they using? We must we must ask this this basic question because you don't use you don't use public resources to seek election to control public fund. And that has been the cycle of what we have. Well, there is their leader, is their and then um, is their paymaster, so they will do whatever it want it takes for them to do that. But they shouldn't be using our resources. They should be held accountable for that. That was why when the president received um received from Fanny in Asu Rock, I said that that's an impeachable offense. If you don't use the state resources for political um for, for your political parties and um, uh, what have you or they should pay back to Nigeria. If you want to conduct your affairs, you take it to the national secretariat and um, you see, PDP conducted their own meeting yesterday. They had it in the National Secretariat of their party, where they talked about zoning the national chairman to not and leaving the presidential uh, ticket open for now. And let's see what happens concerning that. We must apply some basic principles and some basic ethos and values that relate and resonate with public governance and democracy, some measure of decency. You can't use state resources such as using state house, using state vehicles, using state to go for your political parties and meeting. And that's that's using taxpayers' money. Those that voted another sacrilegious act by the present political classes, using the flag of their party in state house. It's an impeachable offense. Why would the governor want to give a speech? And then you put the flag of APC or PDP. The moment you are elected as a governor or as a president, you are no longer APC representative. You are the governor of that state. Those that vote for 
voted for you and those that voted against you, you are representing them. And those that did even vote for you. In actual sense, majority of the people don't even vote for you. I'm not sure the governor of Lagos State got up to 1 million votes. And the total number of voters in Lagos State is close to 6 million. That means that the people that voted for, that did not vote for him, are much more than those that actually voted for him. Same goes for the president. The president didn't get more than 15 plus million votes. And there were 85, 000, 85 million voters. 85, 85 million voters in Nigeria. It means that those that, vote, that did not vote for him are more than those that actually voted for him. So is that popular mandate? Or what, what type of mandate do we call that? And then they will now use the flag of their party. They will put in a cast. They will use it. And they will use state office to promote and project their party. It is criminal. And it is an impeachable affair. It is indecent. Have you ever seen that in other crime where people do that? And people will just abuse office and they abuse people. The first impeachable offense that can be committed by anybody is the abuse of office and privileges. And they've done that left, right, and center across parties from PDP to APC, APC to ABGA, ABGA to whichever one they want to call themselves coming uh, by 2023. All right. Because do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. By the time we get to the next year, 2022, you begin to see the conflagrations of this political party. Another party will emerge because they don't really care about us. All they care about is them seeking election and winning election and to run the private estate. So, like Michael Jackson said, all I want to say is they don't care about us. All they care about is about the election. So that's why they can have swagger. Okay. They can continue to swagger. All right, we'll see how it turns out. But now let's uh, talk about the economy. We'll go back to Anambra in a bit. But let's talk about the economy now. Uh, the president yesterday presented a 2022 budget of 16.39 trillion naira. But of course, there is a budget deficit of um, you know more than 6 trillion. Of course, there's also uh, plans to borrow trillions of naira to you know cover up for all of that. Uh, share your thoughts on, on where we're going with regards um, borrowing. and. Well, let me, let me put it across to you. Last year, you borrow money to fund your lifestyle. I'm just using an illustration. Let me use myself as an example. Last two years, two years ago, I borrowed money to fund my lifestyle, my taste and my value. This year, I'm borrowing, I borrowed money to fund my lifestyle again. My lifestyle increased. I didn't cut my expense. And next year, I'm still going to borrow my money to fund my lifestyle. What will happen to me in five years' time? Now, we are borrowing money because if you narrow it down to an individual and then you take it to the state, it shows that, one, they are not disciplined. They are not, there's no financial discipline. What are the things that we can do or we can stop? What are the things we are doing that we need to stop in order to ensure that we reduce the deficit and we stop borrowing? Because we keep borrowing money to fund the budget. Budget on what? Is it on capital expenditure or the current expenditure? How much money do we vote for the current expenditure? Now, when you vote too much money for the current expenditure, you are funding lifestyle you cannot afford. I was talking to a friend yesterday, and she said the brother took the car of the mom, of the dad, and then the car got, got spoiled and... Uh, he, he took the dad of the mom, that one spoiled, and then he now took that of the dad, and then he's driving. I said, look, tell the young man, he's, he's living a lifestyle. Don't live a lifestyle you cannot fund. If you cannot repair the car, don't drive the car. So if Nigerian cannot afford this lifestyle, the, the bogus lifestyle of our public officials, the allowances we give to them, what steps have they taken to cut the allowances, the extra codes? The waste stages to plug the waste stages in government. You know, different groups have recommended oh, we should tax this, we should tax that, we should block this, we should block that. Have we taxed? Have we disciplined the political class? Have we? Don't we need to reduce the cost of governance on its own? If you look at the budget and you look at the, the, the vote that is going for the cost of governance, you will be shocked. You be sure. And then the National Assembly that has the power over the post is telling the president, you know what, Mr. President, you can borrow to fund this lifestyle. Because they too 
can go on a jamboree like they went to visit the supposed national leader of uh, APC and other things they want they want they want to do they can have money to do swagger or or whatever they call it so uh, as far as I'm concerned is an irresponsible person and if his government is an irresponsible government that will borrow money to fund a lifestyle that it cannot afford if someone should do that um it will be condemned totally and i think we need to condemn we've been borrowing money to fund the nigerian lifestyle we cannot afford we put austerity measure in place and the, the the government have done different ways to raise to raise money and what has happened to the price of product there's a story which you read that secretly government increased the tariff of electricity, electricity yes. um, they increase the tariff of electricity. I know because I use we, we use prepaid meter. I know what it takes to to buy. Averagely, we spend close to about about twenty twenty five thousand them on electricity on electricity tariff. So if I spend that minus my PE minus the VAT, so all my income have have been taxed beyond the means. That's what Nigerians are complaining. That's what Nigerians are complaining because. Left, right, and center government is taking money from you. And yet, government is, is is borrowing money to fund a lifestyle you cannot afford. Yet, you cannot even see the deliverables of 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 democracy in terms of infrastructure, in terms of improvement in your in your standard of living. What has happened to our standard of living? Has it improved, or has it has it? Let me use the word: has it deproved? All right. Well, um, we're moving away from there. Now, let's go back to the southeast, where, of course, there was talks of a state of emergency. It's one of the things that made headlines yesterday. Um, you know, well, um, section, section, section 150 established the office of the Attorney General. Section 150 of the Nigerian Constitution, 1999, established the office of the Attorney General of the Federation as the chief law officer. And he shall be a minister of the Federal Republic. The chief law officer should not be the chief law breaker. Number one, section 305 of the 1999 Constitution as amended made exclusive provision on how and why the state of emergency can be declared. I didn't see the office of the attorney general. In, I didn't see. I didn't see the any reference. The only reference to it indirectly is when it is published in the official gazette, and why, which I think will have to come from his office, but. I didn't see the mention of the Minister of Justice or the Attorney General having the power to make a proclamation or to make a statement, because once you make a statement, it's to that effect that um, a state of emergency will be declared. I, I have not seen, I didn't see, I, I read through that, I read through that section of, of the Constitution. And I, I, the, 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 the conditions were explicit. The power was given to the President to proclaim, and within two days, if the National Assembly is in session, to be ratified by two third of the National Assembly, and if it's not in session, within 10 days to be ratified by the National Assembly, by the National Assembly, both the Senate and their two third members to be ratified. And if that is not done, within those two, it will be declared null and void. So it requires the approval of the National Assembly. That's procedure number one. Two is if the state governor, with a resolution of the state of assembly passed by two third majority, asks the president to declare it a state of emergency, and then that's when it can happen. And there are conditions whether they are war or threatening of war or there is a likelihood of breakdown of law. I don't want to act like lawyers here, just talking on basic knowledge of what I read and what I. I, I interpreted from the Constitution as a man of letters because the degree lawyers get, because people just, the degree lawyers get is bachelors of laws and letters. So as a man of letters, if you are lettered, you can read the Constitution and understand the Constitution. What you cannot just do is to appear before a judge and solicit or advocate on behalf of somebody. But everyone is lettered. Once you are educated, you are lettered. So you have bachelors of letters. So you can read the Constitution and understand what the Attorney General said. If he's in other client, he will be impeached because it will be irresponsible for 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 
for a mini for attorney general of the federation to arrogate to himself the chief officer the powers that he does not have it's an insult and a, and, 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 and and trampling on the constitution of the federal of the federal of the federal republic of, of, of nigeria and insulting the sensitivity of and the knowledge of of, of, of nigeria so this is it's clear explicitly clear on how state of emergency can be declared all right. Um, let, now let's move away from that and go to um, the Daily Independent, some of the stories here. Um, it says here, why I won't support throwing PDP presidential ticket open, and that is from Bode George. Um, the PDP neck OK zoning of national chairmanship position to north, um, defers zoning of presidential ticket, and also Nigerians have a right to, go, uh, to determine who governs them. So it seems like it's you know, different narratives from Bode George and Atiku Abubakar. Um, with regards to the well, uh, well, conversation. Every, every, there's a saying in my local dialect, if you give a hoe to a madman, he will use the hoe to put the ridges to himself. So everybody, the games they are playing is about having a shot on the presidential ticket. So who, I've said it, if you want to go by the law of natural justice, the presidency should should be zoned to either the southeast as first point of call, and then the south-south as the second point of call. The southwest, um, the northwest, shouldn't even be in the conversation of the president and the vice president moving forward. But um, that's for advocates of zoning in actual sense. It's important for them. But I've said it that zoning is not in the Nigerian in, in the Nigerian constitution, it was a PDP arrangement. Even the six geopolitical zone is not represented in the Nigerian constitution. It was it was a fallout of what was brought out of the 1995 Constituent Assembly, and then it was not included in the constitution. You know, the report of the Constituent Assembly uh, is what was modified, ratified, and used as the 1999 yes. constitution by the 12 wise men appointed by Abdul Salam, because that constitution itself was meant to perpetuate Abacha in power forever and ever. So that's where you have zoning. But as far as I'm concerned, um, because of the peculiar nature of how we are found ourselves, I don't really care. Let me tell you the truth. I don't really care where the president comes from. That's that's the truth. I don't I don't I don't I don't care where the president comes from. But if you see the way the political class have been talking, it's about people want the presidency to be zoned to their to their area so that okay they can have a shot at the presidency. Let the best man get the job, but how do we determine who is the best? Because they've all been, they've all been in one form of, um, they've been at one office or the other since 1999. So they've switched and um, assaulted our, 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 our sensitivity that we have lost our sense of decency and common good that Nigeria have just accepted their faith that this is where we have found ourselves. Let's just take it because um, I will, who, will be, who should be listening to Body Judge? Who should even give the voice to Body Judge? Who is Body Judge? Of what value? Of what political value or relevance has he been? And then someone will listen to him. And then um, Adiku Abubakar is had his own shot. We shouldn't be glorifying some spent forces. They've had opportunities to. to, to to do things in the country and they have abused it. I'm a legation and I can talk about body job. I've attended meetings in his house. I know his character, I know his person. So who is he? My friend, you know what? I don't care where the president comes from. Let him let the president as long as we have the limit of, of, of democracy. The president presently is from Casina. What are, of what value has it been to, to people in Casina and the Northwest? The highest form of banditry is happening in the north in the Northwest. We just we read in part in one story in the newspaper, two hundred and fifty victims, kidnapped victims were released from Zamfara. Yes, and, and Cardinal Cardinal State. That's they are, they are from where? The Northwest. Where is the president from? It's from the Northwest. So that the president comes from your region, of what value is it to you? Jonathan spent close to six years. Of what value was it to, to people in Bayesa State? A person just spent eight years. You can't go through Abuli Lagos. Abekuta space, we can't get, it's atrocious. You, 
you you spend the whole of your life going through that route. So um, Brady is the president of Nigeria. is from is from Kasina State. Of what value has it been to Kasina people? It doesn't really matter whether the president is from a village. Some some communities that have governors from them. Okay, I saw a story of a gubernatorial candidate in the Anambra election. The road leading to his house is atrocious, and this person has held public offices in the past that he could have used to better the lot of the people in his community. But because they don't live in the community, the governor was asked that he spend uh, only three days in the state. He governs from, from, from Abuja, and he said, uh, what does he want to go and do in the state? He could run the government from Abuja. Was he elected to run the government from Abuja or to live within his state? And I, I, I went this particular story. Um, I think it's a state in the United States of America, the North, was it not Dakota or South Dakota? Idaho is the state of Idaho. The governor left, he was within the United States. The governor went to the southern border in Texas and he handed over to the deputy. I was rattled because the governor left the state. And people don't understand this principle. The moment, for example, the moment the governor leaves the state, the state is state territory. Because it's the governor of a territory. The governor of Ogun State, the moment he comes to Lagos State, is no longer a governor of is is the governor of Ogun State. He's not the governor. Of, he shouldn't be harassing us with the siren of he shouldn't be because he's a private citizen in Lagos. He does not have the executive authority and privileges he enjoys in his state in Lagos. He has become just one of us in Lagos. And same applies. But what do we know about democracy? And because we have been under military regime for a very long time, and some of the vestiges and bad behavior of military administrators and military administration, we have imported into our democratic um, values. And then um, instead of having democratic values, we have civilian values. So, right. Judy of Nigeria. Um, we'll have to wrap up here. Thank you very much, um, as always, for your thoughts um, on these stories. Um, of course, I wish you a very beautiful weekend ahead. It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just your night today. Uh, it's just your night today. <laughs> yes, it is. It didn't give us a, it didn't give us a bit of face to smile at. All right. No, well, I still my greetings. Have a great class. weekend. Thank you and very everybody, much. And, every, and everybody in the background. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be with you. All right, stay with us while we're uh, taking a short break uh, to tell you a little bit about um, history and what happened on this day in the year 2014. Yes, if you remember the Ebola virus, um, I'm sharing just a little bit of that with you this morning on Off the Press, or rather today in history. Stay with us here on The Breakfast.